I got a chance to work with Amanda when we were both at Intuit, and I was super impressed. And then it turns out she went to a place that's hard to pronounce, but is really amazing. It's either Asana or Asana, and either way, she said they're okay with that. Now, since you all came to see what she's been doing with the design of Asana, Amanda Linden. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be here. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk with you today a little bit about a project that I worked on at Asana. I've been there um, as the head of design for about a year and a half now. And the first year of my life there was really dedicated toward reinventing the Asana brand and um, helping the design team to redesign the product and marketing experience in support of that brand. Um, we are an enterprise company, but we wanted to make a brand that was compelling and interesting enough that it could hold its own against uh, consumer brands. And I'll talk about why. So first of all, what is Asana? Um, for those of you who don't know, Asana is what we call a work tracker. And so um, it's like email in that it's the way that your team can communicate about work, but it's different from email in that it's open by default in the same way that Facebook is open by default. And so you can see all the work going on uh, across your company and you actually do a little bit of work to make things private in Asana. Um, and that really changes the way that people work together because you can share ideas, you can see the projects that relate to your projects, you can find information on a project that finished, whereas in email, um, all the information is always closed and, and locked in between these private conversations that are happening. Um, so it helps uh, teams be much more productive that way. Um, it also, it tracks work across organizations. So you might have a product like Jira that's really good at bug tracking, um, but you wouldn't find designers or HR teams using Jira to manage their work. Um, Asana is something that's usable across an entire organization, and so you can have your whole company on one tool. Um, one of the other things that's important to know about Asana is that if you're a team lead or a people manager, it really allows you to scale your time more effectively. So in the pre-Asana world, I would go to meetings and I would uh, either be very highly involved in a project where I would attend the meetings personally with my time, or I would have to make the choice that somebody on my team was going to work on that and I wouldn't be aware of the context or be able to, to understand what was happening on the project. With Asana, every project that my team is working on, I can follow which means that I'm able to track more closely a lot more projects without having to use my physical time. So it allows, allows people to scale. Um, it works for any type of company. And so we have a lot of customers. We've got customers in consumer and retail space, in the consumer internet space, nonprofit, media, education, enterprise technology, and more. Um, so about 1,000 of the Fortune 2000 are currently using Asana in some way. We're different than some enterprise companies in that traditionally an enterprise company would um, have a really expensive sales team and they would use that sales team to go wine and dine the CEO of the enterprise companies they're selling to. They'd sign a contract and through that contract, they would deploy the software across the organization. And so as an employee of that company, you wouldn't really have the choice to choose the tool or not, right? You'd just be like, well, this is the tool that my company has put in place and, and I'll follow suit. Asana works differently. So 60% of the people who start using Asana are totally self-service. It's an employee at a company that decides to choose it on their own and then they share it with their team. Um, we have, uh, to a lesser extent, sort of a light touch approach where it might require a phone call or an email thread with an Asana employee. And then we have um, even less of our users or our customers are on the premium end of things where we would actually like help them deploy and organize Asana in a way that works for the use case that they are going after. And so because of that, we actually are more similar to a consumer company that needs to make that first connection 
with the end user, the customer. Um, and so it's important for us to really sell there. Um, in terms of why we wanted to do a rebrand, when I joined Asana, the product looked like this. Um, and so the team was already very aware of the fact that they wanted to do a product redesign. Um, and so there was a design team that was getting started with that. And in the process of doing that, we started looking at the design system that we should use for that redesign. Um, and it was, you know, fine and clean and blue. And there were pictures of people in the context of their work environment and, you know, felt professional. And then when we looked at our competitive landscape, we realized that everybody else was also blue and people in the context of their work environment and, you know, the skyscraper pictures and things like that. And we didn't really feel like we told a unique story. And then even though we had those building blocks in place, um, because we didn't have a true definition of our brand, something that was really well articulated across the company, we saw that designers would interpret the brand in their own way. So, you know, one designer would put like nature imagery in and another designer would um, put these like dark gray gradients in. And, and so you saw these variances and it just didn't quite feel like it was all telling the same story. Um, and then we also struggled because Asana is a company that has really smart, intelligent, creative, fantastic employees. And we, we're fun and we want to make work fun. And so we would have these things like if you complete a task in Asana and you turn on the unicorn hack, a unicorn will literally fly across the page for you every once in a while. Um, and that's actually our largest word of mouth growth driver is people talking about the unicorns on Twitter and things like that. So those things are not only cool and fun to put in the product and, and silly and whimsical and, and bring light to your work life, but they're also actually good business choices for us. But we really struggled because, you know, the picture on the left is actually a photo of some of our employees. And the guy in the kind of the red shirt is named Andrew and he's like super fun guy. But in this picture, it's like, okay, everybody act like a business, you know? And so people weren't being authentic. We weren't showing our true selves as we, um, as we projected our brand. And we didn't really know when to be weird and silly and when to keep it serious. And so we thought about what makes a great brand and the kinds of brands that we admire. Um, and we realized that a strong brand is like a person you know, right? That's the best metaphor that I can think of. Um, if a brand is doing well, everyone can describe them and the words that you use to describe them tend to be the same, right? So we would all sort of say like, Virgin always feels cool, MailChimp is fun, Airbnb gives me that feeling of belonging, um, and then Apple, simple, elegant, polished design. And so I'll talk a little bit about the process that we use to create the Asana brand and maybe it'll be helpful for you and your companies as you're thinking about your own brand projects. So the first thing that we wanted to create was the brand story. And so if you're really like building a character, or defining a person, the brand story is like a person's life story. What are they about? Um, and we worked with a company called Moving Brands and we did some internal exercises where we thought about what textures are on brand for us or off brand, like what felt right, what felt wrong. Um, and talked about, we did user interviews and, and talked with lots of different people across the company. Um, and we started to write out together as a team these manifestos of like, what do we believe? What do we love? What do we hate? And just sort of compiling a list here together as a team. There's a couple things that are important about that. One is that, um, and Asana is a company that at this time was about 150 people. So they were just getting to that place where you can't go ask the CEO every time you have a question of what's on brand. You have to have teams that are able to execute autonomously. Um, but the, the process of building these ideas and, and coming together as an extended team across marketing and product and engineering and other disciplines means that early on everybody buys into the idea that the brand is going to change and they immediately feel like they're part of the project and going to adopt it later when we have it all defined. So it's really important. A brand is, is nothing if it's not carried out by the entire company. 
you know, every single person at a company is responsible for the brand of that company. And so it's really important early on to bring the entire group together to, to help have fun defining this. And the other reason it was important is that you could start to see where people uh, differed, you know, Somebody would feel that we were really a blue company and somebody else would feel that we were really a green company and we could talk about that and through that process we would unearth where we needed to align more. And so we spent a fair amount of time working on that um, and I won't read the full brand narrative to you here, um, but we created a long form brand narrative or brand story about our company and our mission and, and what we stand for. And then we have a short form. Um, Another important thing when you're working on a brand is to make sure that you don't um, create so much artifacts that people can't remember, you know, because everybody has to be able to keep the brand in the back of their mind and be able to act on it. And so the short form is the one that everybody at the company remembers, do great things together. And that's basically an internal mantra that reminds us what our company stands for and the feeling that we want to evoke from our brand. A lot of great brands will have one core emotion that they're always trying to convey in everything that they do. And so for us, that core feeling is that feeling of safe teamwork, fun teamwork, doing great things together as a team. The next thing that we needed to do was create brand attributes. So if you think about, again, the analogy of a person as a brand, the brand attributes is, are the words that you would use to describe that person. Um, and so we, here again, we went through the process of, you know, having eight and then having seven and then having six and finally getting down to four. And we found that with the four, people could memorize them and, and keep them uh, in their minds as they do their work throughout the day. And so our four attributes are empowering. And by empowering, we mean motivating, encouraging, and enabling. And so a company out there that we would think of as empowering would be Kickstarter. You know, they're always thinking about the customer or the, the businesses that are making money through Kickstarter rather than advertising themselves. Um, and the next word was purposeful. And by that, we meant passionate, intentional, effective. And we think about a company that's purposeful, I would think maybe Patagonia, where if you buy something from Patagonia, you kind of know all the way through the process of building that that piece of clothing, they made the right choice and that you can feel confident in buying that piece of clothing because you know that you're doing the, that you're doing the right thing from a consumer perspective. Um, and then another one, a quirky. So we wanted to embrace our quirkiness and keep that as a part of the brand. And by that, we mean playful, unconventional, whimsical. An example of a quirk or quirky company, again, is MailChimp. And then approachable genuine, unpretentious, and loving. When we think about a company that's approachable, probably Zappos comes to mind for me, where I can feel the casualness and the emails that they send me and the, the um, language on the website. And when I'm shopping for shoes, they have actual Zappos employees modeling them on the, on the videos that you watch. So as a part of shopping on that site, you actually feel like you're getting to know the people that work at that company. Um, and it really shows through and you make a connection and become more loyal that way. Um, once you have the attributes and the brand narrative, then you can start to think about, okay, the logo mark. A logo is like the face of the person that is the brand, right? It's the thing that it, your logo needs to represent, do great things together, and it needs to be purposeful, empowering, approachable, and quirky. And when we looked at our logo, we just didn't feel like it was giving that feeling. <laughs> but it is blue. Um, we had the three dots and we wanted something that conveyed our um, more of an evolution rather than a total reinvent. We wanted something iconic and simple that could be hand drawn. And we wanted something that um, really represented that do great things together feeling. So we did a lot of sketching, again, working with moving brands and then our internal design team as well. Um, didn't really want anything that was object oriented because our the name Asana is already a metaphor. Um, and so you don't want to have like, you know, a flower and Asana because it's an immediately okay yoga studio. <laughs> you don't want to have a rocket ship and Asana because then it's like, are we taking you on a mission or are we like yoga? So you it really needed to be something totally abstract. And we thought about 
um, starlings in flight and wanted to evoke that feeling of a flock of birds that don't have to land and have a meeting and figure out like where are we going and who's going to lead and how are we going to get there and who's going to do what these birds just organically flow and they seem to be dancing in the sky and having a great time working together. We also wanted to evoke that core three person team doing something together and having a, a similar mission and a feeling of energy and working together. And so then the shape started to evolve and get closer to something that probably would work for us. Um, and eventually we landed here. So we still have three dots, but they're now three members of a team working together, focused by a common energy. It's a little bit of an abstract day, a little bit of a pyramid, a flock of birds. It's so rare to find something so iconic and simple, but we're really looking for this mark to physically embody the meaning of teamwork. We wanted to make sure that it embodied our uh, attributes. It's very purposeful in that the circles inside the A are the same as the circles in the three dots. Um, the A's are all equal distance apart and the word mark and the letter forms are all built using similar shapes and curves. One other problem that we had with our logo before is that there was no vertical treatment, and so we made sure to solve that problem in the logo project as well. So at this point in um, the brand project, I really felt like we were probably done, probably done with the defining, probably ready to have the design team just start to execute. And so I went to the team and said, okay, we're going to be purposeful, we're going to be empowering, we're going to be approachable, we're going to be quirky, go to it. Um, and there were some you know, iterations and designs that came out of that, but we were still struggling. We still didn't feel like we had that clarity of uh, knowing what our style was. And so we created a brand motif, and the brand motif uh, is like the clothing that you wear. What is the clothing that you wear and the, the um, look that you have that helps evoke those brand attributes? We call our brand motif clarity and energy. So when we have clarity about the work and about our work and the energy to get it done, we do great things together. Those moments of accomplishment are magical, so Asana celebrates them. And clarity and energy is broken out into two, um, two poles. We want to have a clean white canvas that gives an undistracted picture of your team's work and the serenity to approach it with ease. And we want to have bursts of vibrancy and color helping you to focus on your most important work and celebrating the progress that you make. And for some reason, that unlocked the team. At that point, they were like, OK, this is generating a lot of ideas for me. I can think of a marketing site that has this balance of clean white with bursts of color. And I can think of a product experience that does that. Um, and so that was sort of the guidance that the team needed to be able to really get down to the, the pixel level detail. So then they began uh, putting together the visual design language. So we created a color system. We were sure to have you know, the clean white, um, still incorporating some blue, uh, but then having these um, vibrant gradients to, to contrast. And we thought very carefully and wanted to be very purposeful about the meaning of color in our product. And so this is our brand color, and this brand color means beginnings. And so when you create a task or create a conversation, the Omni button there is Corinne. If you go through our first use experience, um, we call it orange, coral orange. Um, that's where you see our brand color. But overall, the product experience is a clean white canvas. Instead of being a complicated product that felt really difficult to use and overwhelming, and now uses a metaphor that is universally understood, which is like, OK, every piece of work starts with a piece of paper, and you're making a list. So what is the project name? Let's give it a name. Let's make a list of all the things that need to happen in this project. Who owns those things? And when are they due? But we wanted to contrast this clean white canvas with bursts of energy and color. And so there's also fun animations in the product. By default, if you complete a task, you're going to see the background of the product glow green and this energetic burst of green to blue coming across the page as you complete a task. So in whatever small way we can, we just want to give a little bit of a gamification moment, a little bit of a reinforcement, physical acknowledgement of the work that you've done um, to give that feeling of teamwork. And then the other feature in our product is, is called hearts. 
similar to the like button on Facebook, where if somebody creates a task and they start writing out the task and you start commenting on the task, you can heart one another's ideas and encourage people along the way. So when you heart something, it encourages you to keep um, acknowledging one another's achievements because it glows pink for a moment and then you see the, the red heart. We work to um, create the full design language at that point and we're able to um, look at every pattern and look at the details. We looked at our illustration style and we wanted to keep our unicorns, but to make sure that we embrace them by making them the similar uh, style to the rest of the illustrations that we have in the system. And again, with all the illustrations, we wanted to use shapes that come from our logo mark, these circles, these squares, these building blocks that, that give everything just that right level of visual consistency. We also use a lot of center and aligning in our illustrations to make it feel balanced and purposeful, um, but also want to convey that, that whimsy and that fun. And we put the illustrations in the product um, during moments of pause and break. And so you might go through all of the different items in your inbox and it's empty. And then we call these guys the dot people. Um, they're there to say like, hooray, you're all caught up with your work. It reinforces the meaning of our logo. People understand that better. Um, when you join a project, there's nothing in it. And so we solve that by putting like fun welcome mat in there, things like that. And we applied the system to mobile as well, thinking about how to uh, ensure that it had the right balance of, of clarity and energy. And so that was something that we launched um, in late September. The process took about a year. Um, and then some of the results. So we got a lot of really positive feedback on social, a lot of people tweeting about the redesign and, and um, saying that it looked great, things like that. So we were kind of overwhelmed by that. But one of the other things that you're looking at is what is the opt-out rate? Because again, we're, we're an enterprise company. It's not a situation where um, people want to see change. You know, They're just trying to get their work done and now they've come in and there's this brand new version of the product. So it's one thing if you um, have new users get excited about it, but you always worry about that existing user reaction. But we were really excited to see that less than 2% of users opted out of the new design. So we were able to move everybody over very, very quickly. In other situations where I've done something like this, that number has been more around 20%. Um, we had an increase of 5 to 10% in adoption funnel metrics. And our collaboration rate for new domains increased about 10% as well. And so that's nice to see that these visual changes, we didn't change the, the functionality of the product at all. We just created these animations of like, hey, if you do this, we're going to give you that little visual reward. And doing that actually resulted not only in people saying, oh, it looks beautiful, but also caused people to do it more. Um, we looked at our net promoter with this, and um, I'm not allowed to share like the numbers of the net promoter, but this is a graph that shows net promoter uh, during the history of Asana. Um, and there's the rebrand launch that we did. So it definitely had an uptick for um, young users, new users to the company especially, um, but also for existing users as well. And that's it. Any questions? Hi. Um, Hi. Go ahead. Your turn, Pete. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Um, so I've got a, a question about a detail uh, during the, the brand definition phase. Yeah. Um, you said that the company had roughly 150 people when you started, and you wanted to get everybody involved. Uh, but um, I can't see you involving all 150 people in all of the exercises that go into that. Right. Uh, what was the, the core team for deciding on the definition of the brand? Yeah, um, so early on there would be more people as you have these exercises. I think that they did, uh, Moving Brands did one-on-one -on -one interviews with probably 20 people at Asana. 
uh, where they would spend an hour with that person and just sort of ask them about the company, what do you think about the company, how would you describe the culture, et cetera, et cetera. And so that was work that they did on their own. Um, and there we had representatives from every department, so somebody from engineering, somebody from marketing, somebody from HR, just to get that full landscape, somebody from customer success, um, research, et cetera. Um, and then the, the you know, sort of uh, person responsible for marketing, the person responsible for engineering and for product and for design, we would sort of um, be the facilitators in these larger uh, sort of sessions. Yeah, so it was probably, I don't know, 12 people in those working sessions. Um, at one point, interestingly, the CEO was like, I trust you, I'm going to bow out, you know, so it definitely wasn't a, a hierarchical thing or something that was tops down. All right. Um, can users keep the new design but opt out of the animations? I'm w wondering what you've learned about gamification, because it seems like um, that can either, you know, go two ways, right? There's not a lot in between. You either hate it or love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the default animations of, you know, you check a mark and there's a little green glow, it lasts for one second, if that, um, that's, that's on for everybody. Um, currently, the situation is that if you go to an area called hacks and you turn on unicorns, then unicorns will be um, periodically appearing across the screen. And so it's something that's more of a, like, hidden gem if you can find it and something that, like, people kind of whisper about. It's similar in some ways, I guess, to, like, in and out Burger has all these hidden menu items, right? And that creates a cult following around it. Um, we did launch the, um, we, we ran a test where we turned on unicorns by default to a cohort of users and it, more people ended up, you know, retaining and, and staying with the product when unicorns were turned on than when turned off. So, so far the data is like, I'm, I'm as surprised as anyone else. I personally was like, what? When we first, <laughs> when we first, um, when I first saw those, but you know, I'm a believer now. I also have talked to you know heads of of brand at folks like Dropbox or whatever, where they have an enterprise version of Dropbox, and they started out for a whole period of time saying like, well, if people are using the enterprise version of Dropbox, then let's like cut out the playful illustrations let's you know no more rainbow up at the top like let's just keep it serious and they realized that you know the metrics just weren't as good on the enterprise side and when they started just like using all the same brand elements on enterprise they went right back up so i think what we're learning is that people are people at work you know you still want to have fun at work it's not like you come to the office and you're like all right, no joking now. Like, I mean, this is where you come to, to play and have fun. And the more that you can create that feeling of, of happiness in the product, uh, you know, I'm sure there is a spectrum. There's a point where you take it too far, but um, we've, we've seen good things out of it. Hi, I'm Larry. Thank you to remember me. Oh, hi, Larry. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, something that you did or didn't do or didn't talk about on the project that I expect it to be there, and I would just wonder whether it's no longer an issue in the industry, which is uh, something that probably just happened gradually. There was no black and white version of the uh, color scheme. Uh, there used to be issues with color matching when you tr tried to use a gradient mm -hmm. on, on like a newsprint. Uh -huh. It looked terrible, uh, and uh, whether you had color or not. So th and uh, pro video projectors like what we have here don't look anything or didn't look anything like uh, screens. Uh, so is that no longer an issue? So if I understand what you're saying, um, so one thing that you said was it can be difficult when you're trying to print gradients. That is still a thing. Yeah. We, if we're doing the core inch version of our logo, we definitely have to get a physical sample before we order the 5,000. Um, and it is a challenge, but we have a black and white version of our logo and things like that um, that I didn't include here. In terms of a black and white version of the product, I don't think we went through much of a wireframe phase. Um, I didn't see a lot of mock-ups from the team that were just in black and white. 
Hi. Over here, I, I had a question a little outside of that, that topic. Um, you mentioned that there was no change in the functionality. Mm -hmm. I was just curious what the, how often the company changes the functionality and whether that schedule might have been affected by this project. Um, well, we didn't add functionality uh, during the process of the redesign. But one of the goals of the product redesign, the designer working on that, was really focused on maximizing clarity. So things did move around. Um, and in doing that, the, the physical things that we were moving around, we did in an incremental way. So we launched the new top bar in the old style. We launched the new sidebar in the old style. And we moved things around uh, location-wise, piece by piece by piece, and tested each one of those changes. Um, and so the user perception is like one thing is moving at a time um, and by the time that we rolled out the rebrand it really was just like a visual polish change so I think that helped us get less negative reaction at the at the finish during the time that we were rolling out the redesign there were still other projects going on so we were still launching things like dashboard functionality or conversation features and things like that um, it was a large project and it, it started out with fewer engineers and then toward the end it got to be more and more and more, you know. Um, but we were still able to accomplish some other things. Tough to know what we would have been able to do if we hadn't done this, um, but it, it felt like the right time for a change. Hey Amanda, I'll ask a question. Can you go back to the long version of the brand statement? Because <laughs> I, I didn't quite finish reading it. and. I was going to ask a question about that, like because it's it's really evocative in some some unusual way, um, and I was just wondering how do that many words get put together? Like, is that is that like by one person, or is it like, because there's a lot there, and, and I do see that it like gets tied together with do great things together. But I was just mm -hmm. curious, can you talk about like is there somebody who's like a gnome who just knows how to speak brand stuff or something? Um, yeah, so it, it was a collaboration. We, um, Asana is a company that documents a lot of things and we do a fair amount of writing. So, um, you know, these manifestos were a good input into, you know, creating kind of a rough outline. We worked with moving brands and they wrote this up for us in collaboration with, you know, Justin Rosenstein, who's a co-founder, who's definitely a visionary. Um, we also had a designer named Micah who um, was, you know, quite brilliant in thinking through these things. And so he gave it those final edits uh, right before the end. It was, it's a tough balance to create something that's aspirational, um, but still uh, inspiring and realistic at the same time. You know, it, you, want, you want it to be believable and, and something that people can attach to, but you also want it to be something that, like, really inspires. Okay, I'll take a question. Okay. Seeing no hands raised on my side. Um, can you go forward a bit to the new product? Just one of the screens there. And I'll see if my question still holds. Okay, so one of the questions I have is, have we, I'm, I'm sure you have, have you uh, checked this for accessibility for visual? For example, is there strong enough contrast between the colors, which s seem very light shaded to me, mm -hmm. uh, but may not be when they're put all together? So that's a question. Yeah, um, the contrast between the text and the background is fair enough. It's possible that somebody um, with a visual impairment may have some trouble with some of the like gradients or, or um, sort of the, the differences in grays. We looked at it to a certain extent, but um, I would say that to be honest, I've spent more time working with uh, solutions like that at companies that are, are larger. Um, but we looked at you know, the accessibility number on our, our colors and things like that. So let's give our speaker a hand. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you.